Thank you, Madam Chair. Sue Carlton, present. Luke Charbonneau. Luke Charbonneau. Luke Charbonneau. Brian Mill. Present. Kevin Eckel. Counted for. Peabody. Present. Sue Patterson. We didn't hear you, Sue. <laughs> We're not hearing you. Helen Claire Chamberlain. Good morning. Nick Saunders. Chad Richards. Present. And Beverly Wilkins. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, should we make sure that Sue can be heard before we move along? Helen Flair. Madam Chair, respectfully, um, it lo looks like Member Patterson can hear us. That looks like what she mouthed. And perhaps she could use the chat if uh, if we can't uh, get her audio working. Thank you. Okay. So we will move along. Um, are there any amendments to the agenda this morning? Seeing none. Approval of the agenda. The recommendation is that the agenda be approved by the Board of Health as presented. Could I have a mover and a second? Kevin, you have a question or you're moving? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second, please? Beth, any discussion? I will call the vote. All in favor? That is carried. If there's any disclosure of pecuniary interest, you may declare at any time should one arise. And adoption of the minutes Friday, June 28th and Monday, July 8th. The recommendation is that the minutes be approved by the Board of Health and presented. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Chris? Ken? I'm sorry, just turn away. <laughs> Happens to me. Not a uh, member council. Is there any discussion for errors and omissions in the minutes? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All in favor? That is carried. Correspondence and media releases. So we'll start with the correspondence, Dr. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we have two uh, correspondence. I think the first one is a resolution for the municipality of King Carlin. Address to a number of organizations, including the Board of Health, the uh, Ministry of Children and Community and uh, Social Services, and the of Health and other stakeholders. And the resolution addresses uh, the rising cost of living and rapid inflation that's putting significant financial pressures on individuals, families, especially uh, the disadvantaged, the least influent, the affluent of us. And uh, it calls on the the government uh, to double the Ontario works and Ontario disability support program and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, other development related to uh, relief of financial pressures on, on these families. And uh, the recommendation now is shared with the board. And the uh, second correspondence is that on public health that very district uh, to the uh, Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health. And it is signed by William Chair and the acting on each, and it's related to considering physical literacy for communities, a public health approach, which is a document that uh, is uh, utilized usually by public health professionals to increase, increase the collaboration and effectiveness of work with the community and different partners to increase physical activity and the letter is asking the chief medical officer of health to consider this document in the practice in Ontario. And uh, I, I do believe there's an opportunity, a uh, policy opportunity or window of time there because there is 
review of the standards for public health. So my recommendation is to endorse uh, that approach. And if this becomes part of our standard practice, that, that would be much better than each health unit considering it on their own. And if there is no uh, direction from the ministry to do that, at least we would know why that would be. Okay. Um, when I go and look here, the recommendation we're given is that the correspondence and media release would be received by the board for about for information. But you're recommending that we support both of these. So should that be a separate um, motion brought for me? Uh, it could be my share minutes to the my apology set up there. Yeah, because otherwise we have a recommendation to receive at this time that this need to, to endorse some sort of their separate yeah. correspondence from the year this is that will be okay. So is everyone in favor of going that right with separate resolution that would endorse both of these? And could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Helen Claire. And Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Respectfully, I am not in favor of endorsing the first piece of correspondence. Um, it is, in my opinion, very political uh, in its wording, and I don't think it's appropriate um, for Claire? the health board, which is apolitical. Uh, we don't have it on the floor yet. We don't have the motion on the floor yet ready for discussion. Thank you. So were you moving it or no? No, Madam Chair. Oh, okay. So could I have a mover, Chris? And a seconder, please. Uh, ben. So now we will go ahead with discussion. So sorry for interrupting, but carry on, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for uh, not having the form correct today. Um, I am not in favor of an endorsement for um, 711 um, because, in my opinion, it is the language in it is too political, and I don't think that's appropriate for um, an apolitical agency such as the Board of Health to be taking that on. Um, just off the top of my head as I scroll here on my other screen to try to find it, um, it does, for example, call out the province very specifically. And there's no mention of something that was largely discussed at the federal level last year with a great deal of involvement from stakeholder groups and uh, from that I mean the Canada Disability Act um, which was spoken to by disability advocates at the federal level to make it a livable wage in which case all of this other stuff would be moot. So I, I am deeply concerned by the language and that by endorsing it we would perhaps be uh, unwitting participants in a political um, piece of narrative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anyone else with comments on this one? Ken? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I suppose I will uh, uh, speak uh, in opposition to uh, uh, Helen Clare's recommendation. We are the uh, recipients of funding from the provincial government. We are an agency of the provincial government, and uh, unless uh, unless Sir Dr. Ayer is going to find it in this budget to uh, support the uh, the issue of Income. It's, it's not. It's not just about food security. It's not just about housing. It's the broader issue that has been identified as um, a lack of cash for uh, folks at disadvantage. So I believe that we should uh, ab absolutely advocate to the the funding partner of this organization to uh, to support us in this work. So I appreciate. Uh, uh, Helen Claire's comments, but I believe that um, it would very speak to the provincial government on behalf of these uh, uh, clients that we're trying to serve well. Thank you. Any other comments, Chris? I said I'd like to speak in support of the uh, endorsing the uh, the motion. I don't believe it's uh, overly political. Uh, as um, elected officials, we do have to weigh out. Um, what we choose to critique the province about. And uh, a lot of issues uh, 
I choose not to. It's not worth uh, the effort. But when we're dealing with our most vulnerable uh, citizens in the community, and we know full well the uh, impact the poverty has on, on them and all the social services and police costs and health costs, I, I know last year the county did a resolution prior to the budget, and then the province did respond, raising it by 6.5%. So I think uh, our advocacy is uh, is definitely uh, needed and listened to by the province. So I support the endorsement and congratulate Concarden for uh, pushing the issue and putting this forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Helen Flair? Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to respond. Um, I respectfully suggest that where the Board of Health receives its funding is immaterial to the fundamental fact that we, as the Board of Health, are an apolitical agency. To the second point about elected officials, uh, it being within scope for elected officials to weigh in on this kind of thing, again, I remind my colleagues around the table that we sit here today not as elected officials, but as representatives of the larger community for the benefit of public health. And that leads me to my third point, which is as an apolitical agency, the Board of Health, uh, this letter is out of scope for us other than to receive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Helen Flair. Any further comments, Dr. Herrera? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm just taking that information and, and uh, trying to my, my best align it with, with what we do. Uh, I, I would agree with Helen Clare that we are here as representatives for the Board of Health, not as elected officials. No question about that. And I would agree that regardless of the source of our funding, which is the county and the uh, province, our work should be to serve the community. Uh, I can uh, and, and I agree with her about uh, one point, but I don't see the relevance of it or the mutually exclusive approach. Where uh, um, basic uh, basic uh, income, uh, universal basic income, is an approach that's supported by public health, and we have advocated for this on on many levels for many years to ensure there is sufficient income for the most disadvantaged of us. Uh, and and that might move forward in the future years, but it's not today. I don't see how supporting this one would be um, mutually exclusive to the other one. And I'm not contesting the arguments. I'm just wanting to really put it in a channel where it would best serve the board and the organization, and most importantly, the public and, and great groups. So that's one. How is this mutually exclusive supporting this from universal income because both of them will support the same families, one today and one in the future, and the universal is better. The second one is the political language, and, and I apologize if I missed if there is partisan language in it, um, because we historically did not support anything that is partisan. But I, I wonder, Madam Chair, if I and ask uh, Helen here to elaborate on the political or partisan language. Thank you. Helen Claire, do you have a response there? Yes, if you can just give me a moment to pull it up. So uh, one, two, three. If I can bring you to the fourth paragraph to start. Um, Whereas individuals and families are legislated into poverty. Madam Chair, uh, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll just use that as the illustrative um, piece, because right there in the fourth paragraph, uh, that if we endorse that, we are endorsing that we agree that the province of Ontario endorses individuals and families. Uh, it, we are endorsing that we agree that the Ontario government is legislating individuals and families into poverty. And uh, I don't agree with that. And uh, that's one example. I don't think I need to go, th go through the whole letter. That stands as an illustration of, uh, I think, problematic language in this letter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Herr. Madam Chair, question to Helen Clare and the group. If we 
uh, specifically endorse the cause of the resolution, and we can even elaborate in the letter itself of uh, support that uh, different language could be chosen because legislated, it could be this government of the previous government or the previous government, the legislation has been there for many years, so I don't see it as partisan, but I agree with Helen Claire that different wording could could have been used for this resolution. But I, I was just worried about throwing the baby with bad water. So to Helen Claire, with, with uh, endorsement, with uh, uh, specifying we're endorsing the cause, not specifically the wording of certain uh, items. Okay, thank you. Any, I think I'm sorry, Helen, I hand up. Did I see your hand up, Ryan? No. Okay, Helen, Claire, I'll go back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I respectfully suggest that if the board wants to uh, move forward with this initiative, that we come up with our own letter and we can, uh, I, I have every confidence in the communication team at Board of Health to come up with something that that keeps the baby in and tosses the bathwater out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, hey, thank you. Any other comments on this? So are we voting on the amend on the motion as it's been put on the floor, or are we amending that motion? Um, it would seem to me that a letter of endorsement can do both and like it's it's not either or, it's both and. So this is the letter, this is the motion from the municipality of King Garden that we're endorsing. Uh, absolutely, there can be every right for the uh, Board of Health to submit a, the endorsement letter that says, we agree that uh, so this is a good cause, and we acknowledge that the government's past, present, and future have a responsibility to blah, 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 blah cast it in a good light, that sort of thing. So this is what we're endorsing. And this is the context from the Board of Health that we are wrapping this in so that it softens perhaps some of the uh, political language that is causing concern here. And this, this is what we're endorsing. This is the context that the Board of Health finds itself in. And I would leave that to Dr. Aaron and the uh, communication team to draft that contextual letter. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Just to add, Madam Chair, I agree. The idea that, therefore, in this paragraph, we didn't want any inflammatory kind of a process in any verbal. We agree in principle totally because people are having a rough time. As a result of legislation. But People you know, are but, people and, right? But again, with the exception that we do not, and I trust your acumen in writing letters, they're so non-political because that's where you dwell. So I quite agree and concur. Okay, thank you. And good for Helen Flair. That's a good point, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rare. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just want to echo this last point. Uh, thank you so much, Helen, there for, like, I usually have a radar for a partisan and a political. And uh, obviously, I'm so excited about the subject of support uh, that I understand the point. And uh, I, I do appreciate that because we come to this table as board of health members for the health of all great groups. It's not different municipalities. And uh, it, it's really important to keep that balance. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So if both the mover and seconder and that one are okay with that, I will call the vote. All in favor. That is carried. And that applies to both of those letters then. So we are then moving on to the media release. I don't know if the name is. Yes, Denise is on here. I will turn it over to you, Denise. Thank you, and through you, Madam Chair, there are three media releases on today's agenda. One relates to a dog bite incident which took place in mid-July and requests the public's assistance in locating the dog's owner. The other two media releases stem from two clusters of drug poisonings that occurred in Grey Bruce, the first of which took place in late June while the other occurred in early July. 
Both media releases urge people who use unregulated street drugs to exercise extreme caution with each dose and follow critical harm reduction strategies due to the contamination of the local supply with fentanyl and other toxic substances. The releases also encourage people who use unregulated street drugs to use drug test kits in conjunction with other harm reduction strategies. And that concludes the media release portion. Thank you. Um, I guess I should have a mover and a seconder to receive the media releases. Uh, Kevin and Sue, is there any discussion on those? I will call the vote. All in favor? That is carried. And over to Dr. Aaron for the medical officer of health update. September 9th, I'm just going to share my screen. We have a number of uh, reports. I hope that will be uh, as useful to the board and the public as they have been for the housing departments. The first one is uh, on the, the opioid situation in Great Bruce. Uh, we continue to work with our partners, and one of the works that we do is the SOS uh, program supportive outreach services. It's uh, it's a unique. Uh, approach to go out to the community and support people who uh, need help most, uh, specifically people who are using substance, people who don't have phones, and uh, people affected by uh, human trafficking, uh, plus any person who is not able to get access to uh, healthcare in, in general and they're struggling to, to find uh, essential services. Uh, and uh, you would see from the past two year data that uh, mostly our men were using this, but there has been an increase in, in uh, females as well. It's almost 60, 40 percent. Most people who use it are between the age of 20 and 65, with a majority between 40 and 40. And uh, you can see in, in the graph I have on the screen. Uh, the, the number of people losing it uh, is, is steady and continues to be. And there is a breakdown of these uh, data. The number of individuals are around 4,000 in the past two years. And when, oops, many of them are new, uh, the majority of them uh, return to receive service. And the service is uh, twofold. There are clinics in, in, in um, Hanover Clinic and in, on sound that are every two weeks and they alternate. And there, there are teams that go to the community, the water community in Great Bruce and provide the service uh, where people are at. And the interactions, this is the, the orange color is uh, the returning uh, individuals or clients. The um, black data is uh, such a data is the you know uh, individuals it's just a, just a little thing there like there are lots of infer from these graphs but if you look at january there was a spike usually and that's consistent with the in, in general with resolution new year's resolution people wanted to better their life like any person like nobody that i've met whether using drugs or without a home who's enjoying that situation and it, again this, this analysis of the data that you do between the two would help the partners provide to be prepared for certain months for increased service. Site services, uh, as you can see here, addiction medicine, counseling, education, um, facilitating primary care. Primary care and addiction and, and counseling are the majority of people who are using the service. And again, it's uh, most individuals would have multiple uh, type of service received through this program, not one. Rarely ever a person would come and say, I have only one issue to deal with. The medical interventions, and that would be on the slide, the next slide. Um, the uh, opioid treatment, testing, treatment, care. It's almost third by third by third, those ones. So if on the medical front, there are three types of services that we are remapping or we're putting in, in categories, and there are related to testing, treatment, and opiate treatment specifically. So opiate treatment actually takes 30% of that front, which is major. 
and basic needs, whether it is clothing, food, drink, and personal items. And, and that's related to the resolution we just discussed there. Many people are going uh, without food. And actually, we do where they actually need five percent to eat them. And this is Canada. And it's really at the moment sometimes to see this. And the majority of the people who come to this program will benefit from that aspect of the program. Uh, another service is referral to other services, whether it is tertiary or about more advanced uh, addiction, primary care, public health, and social services. Uh, you see social services is the top in that list. So we're connected with multiple partners, and, and this is a collaborative effort from the wider review scheme, not only public policy. This is a long list of the services that we provide in the slide before the last. And they're being remapped into the categories that we mentioned before. It's just easier to look at it and ensure certain you know, data points that are helpful. And the final slide is just a summary of the number when it started, when it yeah, ended. And, and the credit goes, major credit to Dr. Zay, to uh, uh, Dr. Green's attitude, who was with us for three years. And this is the, 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 the whole program or the whole initiative was, was uh, her design and her support to the different partners. And now it is led by many partners, county, uh, uh, the counties of the county leaders in this as well. So that's uh, my first uh, set of uh, first report that I'll share. I don't know if people would want to ask questions as we go or at the very end. I, I'm wondering if anyone has questions if we do them at the end of each report rather than all together at the end. Does anyone have questions on this? I am not seeing anyone, so go ahead, Dr. Eric. Thank you. The uh, second report is, uh, or sorry, the next item is strengthening public health. That's standing item by share. There's no specific update on it other than the pro progress continues or the process continues from the product to update the standards. The uh, item 8.3, sexual health update. So the uh, sexual health is uh, part of the work that we do in the health unit and specifically zooming in within sexual health, there is syphilis as a unique disease that is a reportable disease and we do a lot of work in the community related to preventing and reducing the rates. In general highlight, there has been an increase in the rates of infectious disease related to syphilis. In, in Canada, in Ontario, and in Great Bruce. And, and syphilis is unique in a way, it has multiple stages. Uh, and testing for it and, and the treatment is, uh, is complex. And for the longest time, the rates were so low that many health providers in the community might have not dealt with syphilis for a long time. So we're working on multiple fronts, and I'll go to the very end of the report where the money for public health is. We do case and contact management similar to what people know about COVID, where it, every case is reported to the uh, medical officer for health office, whether it's from uh, labs or whether it is from uh, uh, the healthcare providers who identify the clinical aspects. We uh, support the field with uh, what type of testing and treatment and the interpretation of the results. We provide uh, health with the treatment as well. And uh, the clinical services and partnership education is, is also part of it. Uh, so there are many moving parts for, for this. And uh, for the, I think for the past 10 years, there was only one case in congenital syphilis, which is in a born baby in Rebus. And, and it, it was in 2023. This is something we haven't seen in 10 years. And it's, it's a tragedy when babies born with different that, but disease. It's usually similar by for the rest of their life uh, in, in general. Um, and, and again, people who are not born with it obviously get acquired through mainly sexual uh, intercourse and uh, unprotected sexual intercourse, I should say. And uh, we, we do support the community, uh, family, individuals, and, and healthcare workers in, in all the process of 
that are dealing with this business. I'll stop there, Madam Chair, open to questions at table. Any questions from anyone on this report? And go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And it's uh, maybe more philosophical than practical, but um, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, regardless of, of what they are. Um, it is a, uh, you, you can call it by all sorts of different names. It can be morality, it can be faithfulness, it can be whatever it is. Is um, and, I, and I'm not saying that public health should be the morality police. That's not what I'm saying. But is there a, a stream of education that the public health uses uh, rather, rather than saying, you know, we'll, we'll treat you and we'll try and catch the disease after it's happened. Uh, once again, are we looking farther upstream to say, you know, if you don't do this, or if you do do this, you know, protective, this will help, or, or are, we, are we there yet, or are we just in the assessment and the treatment uh, stage in this resurgence of syphilis and or other sexually transmitted diseases. For you, Madam Chair, definitely education is, is key in our work, and uh, we do take uh, an approach of uh, um, support, and we, we meet people where they're at, and uh, there's always education how to prevent and how to protect the partner or other individuals in the community, and, and that's uh, that's something that our staff do on an individual level. We do it with groups. We uh, provide that education at school, at, at the community events, and we have it on our website uh, on many, in many levels. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we will move on to the next report. So the next report, Madam Chair, is uh, related to initiatives led by the Health Promotion Team, and uh, it's it's a team that works on many fronts. Uh, four fronts that I mentioned here are related to vaping rates and in the community. Uh, the second one is uh, related to climate change and, and uh, collaboration with different partners for health and all the policy approach. And the uh, third one is related to, uh, <clears throat> it should be by admissions here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Department of Acute Infectious Disease to visit primary um, daycare and provide education about uh, nutrition and, and uh, a tool for nutrition environmental self-assessment for daycare. And, and the program has been well received by the uh, the daycare centers, they're getting consultation from our dietitians how to improve the, the diets that they use for their clients. And uh, finally, it's related to the Regional Road Safety Committee. And there is, there is work on, on, on all of them. The vaping is, is most concerning to, to me just because we have achieved so much success in uh, combating tobacco smoking and vaping for the past few years on the policies that have passed, uh, have changed the, the uh, landscape and, and people not realizing that vaping is as harmful or maybe more harmful than tobacco in certain aspects. I remember just a uh, uh, side note on that. The first report that came out of John Hopkins, I read a pathology report of individuals who, who died of uh, um, lung disease related to vaping early on. I think it was 2019 or 2018. And the description of the pathologist who wrote the report, uh, he described that the tissue of the lung was insulted in the same way that mustard gas, the old or first and second voice, was uh, affecting the illness. So this is, it's, it's not a uh, vapor water vapor that, that people are in here when it is chemical and, and sometimes we don't even know what these chemicals are. Um, environmental, uh, the built environment, we work with the community and with their partners on uh, climate change aspects. And um, again, there are many 
many um, overlapping initiatives in this report among these initiatives and partners. Uh, open to questions on this one as well. Thank you. Any questions on this report? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for this. I, I do appreciate it. there was um, says in the key points, health promotion staff have been meeting with lower tier municipalities to seek synergies, and I, and I appreciate that, uh, that, uh, that work, that policy. And the two questions that come out of that they are, first off, our municipality does have like a health care representative on our staff. So with whom are you meeting when you go to the lower municipality, just so we can be aware. And once again, uh, they, the, the people of any municipality are inherently more connected with the municipality rather than public health. It's just a tighter relationship. I'm wondering if we have a uh, policy or money set aside whereby distribution of any of this information can be included with the distribution of tax bills or other uh, municipally distributed um, information. Like how can how can we help? How can the municipalities help the public help um, in in distributing the information? So like, so with whom and how can we help? Yeah, uh, through you, Madam Chair. So there are different channels of communication between our teams and the municipality. Yeah. I'm just trying to wrap my head around uh, when you say we um, in like the public health yeah. act, you're putting the lens of the municipality to the politics. No reason. I just want to be fair to the but we. Yes. Yeah. So the health unit has different channels of communication. One of them is with the uh, uh, with the staff in the municipality, the planners. Uh, the the term health and all policies uh, really is is uh, an awareness raising exercise to connect with different staff in different municipalities, whether it is a CEO level, the planners, CAO, sorry, the 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 uh, communication teams. And uh, we do send, um, we have started sending letter to municipalities or newspaper to municipalities. I can't remember the, the title, but then you will just text me probably. In action. Uh, it, it's biannual where, where we set up all the things that we do with the municipalities and the regulations that have changed. There are multiple aspects to it. I'm not going to do it justice. Like I know on the emergency front, municipalities work on emergencies, and we have public health inspectors in the, in the inquiry groups that sit at that table as well and provide them the performance. And the health promotion team obviously does uh, work multiple aspects on, on all these fronts, whether it is uh, specifically related to health and all policies or climate change. So again, it, it's really not one channel of communication. Okay. And, and I do believe in Griffiths is well established. And uh, during the pandemic, we even earned a bit more credit to in, in uh, um, providing the advice to the municipality. There is a there is a saying in public health that we earn our credit in health protection and we spend it on our health promotion. We protect the community from diseases like syphilis and other people other diseases. And when we go to say, let's quit smoking, let's eat better, that's where we stand that credit because it's not as, as uh, uh, easy. Uh, so again, that's a long clear answer. I don't know if I answered some systems. Thank you for that question because I've had the same one, how that was being communicated to the municipalities. Are there any other comments or questions on that report? Seeing none, I move on to the next one. Then we need to wait for project update. The last one yeah. is the organizational strategic matrix project. So we need matrix project for the benefit of people around the table here you know, and the public who might have not seen uh, this. Um, there are different programs in the health unit, and uh, uh, all of them have um, 
similar type of support, whether it's epidemiology or communication or, or uh, uh, other aspects. And, and it, it is usually, um, when you look at the organizational chart, it's, it's very uh, easily depicted. There is hierarchy and chain of command, and people report upward in the organization. Uh, with the matrix, you would imagine that there is another one that's vertical, where uh, each program has one or more individuals who have specific uh, expertise related to the service and the matrix project. For example, communication is easy. We have media coordinators who are supporting all these programs, and in each program, there is one person or two who would be the contact for that program with the uh, media coordinators. And uh, through that work, they will develop a bit more specialty or expertise in drafting messages and, and understanding how the messaging uh, is best positioned. Similar to communication, there is epidemiology and uh, data analysis. And, and it is double the amount of work to communicate to, to teams, but it is way more effective and no specialization in it. And, and we have been utilizing this uh, method for the past couple of years, and there are five uh, programs here just described uh, where they are well, well established and well uh, um, achieved. Uh, one of them is the climate change. Similar to the previous report, I put these two reports just here to, uh, to, to show the amount of work that's done behind each initiative. So the program will be reaching out to the community or the partners, but also internally we have two or three teams supporting that team. Climate change is, is one of them that is very complex. Human health development. We have different programs in the health unit that are working to support different demographic you know, uh, older individuals, uh, babies, uh, families, mid-aged individuals, and how we can collate the information that we send out and the approach that we do to be consistent in all these. And again, that's, that's a project that's, that's been there for a year and a half or so. And uh, it, it is very successful in aligning our messaging. So we're not creating a message three, four times in different programs, rather we're not creating the real. Uh, indigenous relations, it's another one, sexual health, and including the syphilis, uh, approach or the syphilis aspect of it, tobacco and vaping prevention, that's what I mentioned earlier, and their matrix community of, of practice. And these are certain um, lessons learned and, and other aspects that internally we evaluate how we're using this, this uh, approach and where it can be used and where it cannot be used. Again, Madam Chair, it's an open subject and a big soft topic. I can speak for a long, but I'll stop there and see if there are questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Does somebody have a question? Thank you, Ken. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if if you could, Dr. Era, the on on page two of five under climate change. Uh, climate change is. Uh, um, I think it's imminent rather than eminent that it should be, but that's your that's my correct. Affecting physical and mental well-being of all with disproportionate impacts on equity-seeking populations, and and my focus is on that term equity-seeking because you know for for the longest time equity-seeking, Madam Chair, had like it was a very uh, strong language because it was focused on. Uh, disadvantaged populations, and and we had this idea, and you know, I'm, I'm just wondering how the the strategy or the policy of of the public health department includes, you know, old people, young people, indigenous people, outdoor people, you know, indoor people, tall people, short people. Like how where where do we go with that? Because I don't want. You know, personally, I don't want equity seeking to be so diluted that it doesn't mean anything. So I'm just wondering if you could expand, like, what what direction are we taking with that sort of phraseology? Certainly, thank you uh, for the question. So you, Madam Chair, 
So the equity lens is a lens that we use in public health, and it really is related to who who is most disadvantaged in a certain situation. In climate change, it's it's a unique uh, problem and has many facets. Some of them are like all in public health has many facets, and some of them are related to heat waves. Heat waves. The, the majority of people who uh, are affected negatively and pass away because of heat waves are older individuals, uh, younger individuals, workers, outdoor workers, uh, somebody who's fixing the power line uh, would not have the luxury that the rest of the community would have to go to an air conditioned uh, environment. Even the individuals who are homeless, we have certain interventions in public health of cooling centers where they can go to. However, a worker actually who needs to do their work to keep these air conditions conditioning working. And they need to be on that line and, and they are disadvantaged. So how can we ensure that there are in our uh, set of interventions and policies things to protect those workers from this or older individuals? Uh, again, uh, yeah. I think it was in 2019, I'm not sure about the year, but Quebec reported a heat wave with 50 plus deaths. Yeah. Uh, Ontario didn't report that because we don't have a system to screen or track for it. But when you see like 50 people die in a heat wave in three days, uh, and, and almost all of them are uh, older individuals. So that, that's really where the term comes from. And the, the Equity, uh, as as you mentioned, is it's usually disadvantaged individuals or people who are using drugs or homeless. But it really depends on the problem at hand. In public and in climate uh, change or heat waves, it is a different set of individuals who will be most affected by that. So again, it's it's a different use for that term, but it's a good question that uh, hopefully I provided some insight in. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I am seeing them. So I think we have um, the client satisfaction survey item. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's the last I believe. It's a, so we, we have different ways to have input from public and clients and partners. And uh, over the during the pandemic, we had a couple of months where we can respond immediately and uh, triage that calls. After the pandemic, we went back to, again, we improved on different aspects of it, but some of it is related to uh, a code bar that we provide to clients after the service or a code bar that is in our emails. People can uh, provide this, the, the feedback in many ways, including the phone lines, but we also put on our website a uh, link for providing feedback on how we've done. And this is a data from the past six months. We started this, I believe, the last fall. So uh, there has been, like again, the the amount of feedback we receive is way more than the numbers here. This is only the website and there are other aspects that, that provide direct feedback. But from this aspect, we received uh, 34 uh, input data, which is reasonable sample to, to do calculations. And the majority of people agree strongly that they received the information they needed, they are happy with the service, and um, it's... I'm looking for... I usually skip on the positive things and go to where we can actually improve. And uh, that, that not to dilute that the majority of people are very happy with the service, individuals and programs. Uh, overall satisfaction is, is excellent. Uh, the comments directly about the individuals, as you can see on the screen, and page, page, which page is that? Number two in the report. Uh, and, and on page number three, there were two uh, sets or two puts of input of, of feedback that uh, is uh, 
room for improvement. One of them is the call, um, somebody called for vaccine advice or vaccine scheduling and it didn't go well and they uh, reach out through this, but they also reach out through the, it was escalated from the staff to the manager to uh, Dr. Zed at this point and the team and we put together a um, Within a week, I would say this was addressed. Uh, we, we put uh, a logic model of how uh, we need somebody to respond immediately within the same day about vaccines. And, and that was resolved. The second input was a point that took a year. And again, that was a catch up for after the pandemic for the, uh, I believe it was a dental program, the oral health program. And, and uh, we are not working alone on this. We have to send individuals who need to complete the application, help them complete the application to receive the support from the province. And we either treat them in our own clinics or if the problem is, is complex, we send them to the hospital for surgery, we don't do surgery here. So the appointment on, on uh, that front used to be more than a year waiting list. Now it's way less than a waiting year. So again, just uh, sharing with the board how things are um, addressed, how we receive our feedback from different inputs. Like again, this this number before in 2019, you would find maybe 200, 300. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the number, but it was way more than the 30 or 40 uh, input. And the only difference is now you'll see it directly through the programs through uh, the barcodes. Uh, to the managers and and again it's redundancy in receiving feedback but uh, it, it's better to hear it three times instead of not hearing it at all. There is some data about the uh, distribution of what we call is I think six of them from Bruce County, 21 from Great County. Can't infer much from this sample. It could be Great County uses the services more or it could be uh, the Bruce County individual are more satisfied and they didn't feel the need to respond. Age groups, different age groups, varying from less than nine to eight plus. So many, many individuals or all age groups use as a service or know how to reach us. And that's the uh, end of my update. Thank you. Any comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, then the I'm showing here we have 8.7 arrangement for temporary time limited. That's fair. Okay. okay, so that's the next one. Then. Yeah, that, that one is uh, related to uh, the parental leave that I've been taking for a number of months, and uh, there was an arrangement uh, with the mother on each from the southwest to uh, uh, cover for. Uh, a limited time coverage during this leave and there is uh, according to our policy the need for a resolution or a motion to appoint uh, the acting wage to provide that temporary limited coverage sure. so it's not to receive rather for a motion okay so the recommendation that i have here then is that the medical officer of health updates be received by the board of health for information and that the board approves a motion to appoint an acting MOH to provide temporary time limited MOH coverage during parental leave. Mm -hmm. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Helen Player and Beth. Any comments or questions on this? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All in favor? Scary. We are on to corporate services. Yeah. Madam Chair, sure. this is the May 2024 financial update. Uh, so we received our funding announcement for 2024 from the Ministry of Health on June 25th. The 2024 group funding included restoring mitigation funding to our base budget in addition to the 1% increase that was promised to us. So the total group funding in our funding letter agrees to what's been budgeted in our 2024 budget and what's reflected on the statements that we've been reporting on throughout 2024. Uh, as of May 31st, we have a surplus of $191,000. Uh, 
uh, 89,000 of that related to the senior dental program that's been carrying that surplus from that extra funding for 2023 and 102,000 of the surplus related to our uh, mandatory base programs. Um, and most of that would be from the underspending and our operating expenses. We would say our funding is aligned with our budgeted expectations. Uh, our salaries and benefits are slightly below budget. There's some gap in our position consulting position that we are recruiting for. Um, and our benefits are slightly over budget in our owner's line. And that relates to the expanded eligibility criteria that they announced in 2023 for owners. For operating expenses, most times continue to be uh, under budget. Um, we do issue monthly reports for our managers highlighting utilization of their budgets, whether they're over or underutilized. Some managers are sitting what they have left to spend for the year. For our capital projects, um, as of the last site report I received from Wednesday, July 24th, the substantial completion date is still set to be today, July 26th. Um, the quick equipment is stored built here at an offsite location. Uh, it's planned to be moved in August 12th, so that we move into the space. And they've got some cleaners hired to make sure the uh, cleanup after all the construction is completed. And so they're hoping to be in an operating space in early September. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Kim? Seeing none. We will move on to the next item then. But I'll through you, Madam Chair. Um, so we're looking for a updated banking resolution. We can temporarily add our senior public health managers um, as a position uh, listed as having signed for you with our bank. So we currently um, with the current positions we have internally and with the potential lead coming up, that would only need one internal employee plus our chair and vice chair as having signed authority. Um, the position consultant position being vacant as well. So um, we do have a policy that transactions over 5,000 require two to sign. So we need to mitigate that risk and make sure we have the ability here to approve the MTs and transaction by the bank. So we're looking to temporarily add our two senior public health managers with having to sign authority of the bank during that period. Thank you. Any questions or questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, on the org chart, are the senior uh, public health managers the most senior positions that are uh, on that chart at this point, short of short of vacant positions, of course? Three months. So we, in the previous resolution that says directors, which we no longer have the director position here, the senior managers are the most senior management positions we have um, that reporting to the CEO and the position consultant. So yes, they would be most senior. Thank you. Let go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I noticed, uh, and maybe it's just a question of clarification on the banking resolution. I think it's from 2018. It's on RBC letterhead in the agenda there. Um, the list of signing officers there doesn't appear to include the vice chair. And I'm just wondering, is it the intent that the vice chair has the signing authority or or not? Uh, for you, Madam Chair, next to our policy, I've always been at the board chair and the vice chair has some authority in the organization. All right. So, so the new resolution will include that position then? Okay, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Any further comments or questions? I have one that has to do with, and I guess I'm relating this back to the township. So the mayor or deputy mayor can sign, is one of the signing authorities, and the treasurer or deputy treasurer is the other. And it's always one of each of those. It would be two internal signs. Is that the same way it works here, that there's always external and then internal? Uh, three months and more currently there's been any two, any two positions that are listed at the signing can sign. So if they are both internal, they can sign or it could be a mix. Okay. Um, but we haven't specified that it has to be a one external, one internal. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Nick, can I see your hand up? Okay. I saw somebody's, I thought. No, it was my cat uh, crawling on my laptop. Sorry about that, <laughs> Matt, Jerry. It's a kid. Thank you. Uh -huh. So if there's no further questions, then the recommendation is that the banking resolution be amended by the Board of Health to temporarily add the senior public health manager position to the list of authorized positions and financial report for May 2024 be received by the Board of Health for information. Could I have a mover and a second replaced? Chad and Luke. And if there's no further discussion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you define temporary, please? I will turn to King Thor. Three, Madam Chair. So um, the lease period, the rental lease period. So November-ish, whenever that is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If there's no other questions, I will call the vote. All in favor? That is carried. Other business. Uh, 10.1 updated. B513 closed session board policy on your reporting closed session. Are you speaking to this one, Dr. Yes, Madam yes, Chair. Madam Chair, so in the uh, May meeting, we have posted all the policies except one, the, um, right. the policy 513 closed session on the recording. The board directed the staff to reach out to the ombudsman to verify if the uh, the recommendation is to have the audio and to review our policy for confidentiality or for uh, and related to the camera dealing with the documents in from closed session and open session. We have the same policy but you have with the uh, confidential information. So the response, I'll share my screen. The response from the Ombudsman office was uh, an email communicated with them in a meeting, but we also uh, Lauren from the Ombudsman uh, confirmed that the two points I mentioned to her were correct and the two points were as so as a best practice, the Ontario Ombudsman Office recommends recording audio on open and third session. The uh, second point as a board fault is to be advised that the Ontario Ombudsman Office does not provide policy review Include on review of policies related to confidentiality or closed session. Um, I included uh, also under that email the policy that we have for confidentiality, which, which I do believe it's, it's uh, as uh, robust as it can get, whether it's related to the security uh, of physical or electronic records and. Uh, it's on the screen right now. I can put it up there. And um, related to removable media, whether it is uh, on our computers or our network or in in uh, the form of the hard uh, copy and physical copies, all of it is uh, is again we use the same robustness for health information for our clients for any anything that is uh, sensitive. And there has not been an, an issue, uh, whether it is in the um, ministry uh, assessment that happened in 2018 or in any other review by uh, internal or external related to that. So again, I'll share the recommendation myself is to um, provide or to proceed with the audio recordings of the sessions, closed sessions, fit before the external. Uh, we don't stream those. So when they're recorded, they're recorded on our computer, moved into uh, memory card and put in the storage somewhere where we uh, locked uh, minutes off for in camera. And uh, again, the, the policy is it's straightforward, but open to questions just as well. Thank you. Are there any questions? Luke? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess uh, my opinion remains the same, that uh, we ought to have a policy that lays out a couple of additional things to what's in the existing policy. Uh, one, the length of time that we would retain audio or video recordings, um, and also um, 
the criteria under which um, anybody could access, particularly the recordings of closed meetings. I forwarded along a couple of policies that exist, one from our friends in Southgate uh, and another one uh, from the City of London. Uh, and those policies uh, have those items in them. I think they're, it's good practice uh, for us to um, determine how long we're going to retain a recording and also determine, particularly in the case of closed recordings, who can access them. I think in the case of the two policies I'm rep I forwarded along, um, they um, set a time limit of one year uh, to retain those recordings, understanding that the official record of a meeting is is the written minutes and, and not that record, not that video or audio recording. Um, and then they also identify, I think, uh, that in the case of an ombudsman's investigation, it would be made available or any other any other occasion as approved by, well, in their case, council, but in our case, it would be the board. So, I mean, I'd like to see us add a couple of those, a couple of items to either the existing policy or to a new policy uh, so that we can all have clarity on um, just how these records um, will be handled. So that's my view, uh, Madam Chair, and, uh, and of course the board can take it or leave it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment on uh, Helen Claire? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is good to look at other municipalities uh, and their policies, but it is very important to remember that we are not a municipality. Our model is not a municipal model. With regard to how long we keep um, audio recordings, um, I, my point of view would be that we keep it as long as we keep in-camera minutes. Um, it is backup for those in-camera minutes. And uh, so that would be my thought on it. With regard to um, how those that information is kept and how it's used, I believe that we already have existing um, policies that speak to that because it would be covered by the same um, access that allows anyone to look, or rather allows a select few to look at um, closed meeting minutes. So I, I don't really think we need to delay this. I think we really just need to pass it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Once again, uh, I will refer to the both and. I concur with the policy that's here. I think it is uh, robust, but I also believe that there is opportunity uh, to refer this to the executive committee who would generally review policy and bring it back to us anyway. And they make a concrete recommendation to the board for approval in some specified period moving forward, but two things. Yes, we I concur with this, absolutely. Secondly, is there room for improvement? Yes, but that's through the executive committee coming back to the board. So if if I'm not sure how that affects the presentation of the of the recommendation, Madam Chair, whether whether it's two things or whether you want to just do this and then a separate motion or recommendation to refer this issue to the executive committee for a um, you know presentation back to the board to amend it in any way or not. So but I, I want to affirm the the wisdom of uh, putting this one affirming this one as it is allowing opportunity for amendment through the executive committee. Okay, so I think this one is in front of the board now because it was referred to the board by the executive committee um, for comment by the board. So what we're saying is we're going to send it back to the executive committee to um, do a review of that policy and include in it the comments that have been heard from the board. Uh, if I may just yes. clarify, so what I what I just heard you say was, Madam Chair, this this is the recommendation of the executive committee to the board or have, have there been a consideration by the executive committee of this policy and this is the one that the executive committee is presenting to the board for uh, passage or, or is there opportunity for further amendments help me up with that please so I think what the executive committee was asking was to have these issues looked at for the board to be aware of what we were recommending should be changes in there 
and get towards info on the basic ones. Luke, I'm going to reach out to you for your comment on this, what our intention was there. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And as you're quite right, the executive committee discussed uh, the policy uh, and I didn't recommend it to the board. We we um, forwarded it onto the board without a recommendation so that you could have a discussion so that we as a board could have a discussion about it. Um, it was it's I, that was driven I'll be direct with you by my concerns, uh, wanting to see it be more robust. Um, and I wanted to put that before you. I, I appreciate the executive committee uh, uh, creating that opportunity. And so I put those comments to you. And I think uh, what we need, the executive committee, I think, Madam Chair, I hope you'd agree, needs either the board to pass the policy as it is or direct us to make the changes uh, that I'm suggesting. Uh, and then we could come back with a, another document with those changes. I think that's, I think, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I mean, I disagree with Helen Claire on the substance, but I agree on the, on the direction in terms of the fact that we need a decision here, uh, so um, so may so we can you can in my view, Madam Chair, we should do one of two things: the board approve the policy as it is here before us now, or direct the executive committee to um, come back and make uh, uh, the amendments uh, either that I have suggested or other amendments if the board sees fit. Um, those are my comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope that helps clarify. Thank you, Luke. Dr. Eric. Yeah, Madam Chair, I I do believe these two options are not mutually exclusive, can be done together. We approve the policy as is, and we can send it for further improvements. Like we always evaluate and approve anything else. And and the side note uh, about the uh, policies that come from municipalities, and I did review them. Like one of them was to retain the records for one year, and everybody around the table knows. The statute of limitation is two years. So if we're going to deal with anything legal, it's going to be two years. The CRA is seven years. For a certain health record, 10 years. We do have a way to, to manage those things, and it's not new. Uh, nevertheless, again, back to the, uh, the next step in management, I do believe we can approve it as is. And, and we know that we have been dealing with the same sensitive information before, and there has not been an issue then we can always improve with another uh, round of uh, specific recommendations if needed through that exact measurement. <laughs> Chris? That sounds like an excellent idea. We approve as is, and uh, certainly there's always room for review and we can refer those concerns of Luke's vice chair back to executive. So I do think there could be a few tweaks, as, as Luke pointed out. Good. Okay. Um, then the next item in other business is 10.2, the land acknowledgement and participation in Indigenous communities and events. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is, I, I don't believe it's uh, something that, that is important for the long run and for things that are uh, way overdue from cultural point of view, not specifically for our board or our clinic. Land acknowledgement, uh, if I it was brought forward by Nick Saunders, so he can speak further to what I'm going to say. I do believe if we work with Indigenous communities in Fair Bruce and develop land acknowledgement for the board, and the second part is participation in the Indigenous community events. And forgive me if I take three minutes or four minutes on this, and, and I'll, I'll just speak not scripted. We have a culture in Canada of, of uh, open openness and acceptance of many cultures from around the world. We have different types of food from all over the world and you name it. If somebody uses the word uh, halal or eat, everybody knows that it's related to Middle Eastern uh, Islamic culture and, and we're accepting of all of this. I, I challenge us, all of us, that we might not even know the terminology that's used in uh, our most uh, authentic owners of, of the land. And can we do more? I, I'm sure we can do more. There has been invitations to certain ceremonies. Dr. Zayed myself attended. I can see these ceremonies going around the year, and I wonder if our board would, uh, would commit to attending a number of them or doing certain things that, again, I, I'm not the expert in this, and Nick is on the line, so he, he can speak further to what we can do. 
the, the reconciliation recommendations have been out for, for a number of years, and I do believe as leaders, and we can do a lot on this, and, and I can add one, one tangent here. In the, um, in the matrix uh, projects that I mentioned, there was one where we looked at what we can do in the health unit to welcome the community if they walk in and how we can increase awareness in our staff, and we did certain things. Then we put a list, I asked the committee to put a list of 20 recommendations we we're going to uh, signal out to create those businesses. And let's say we send it to 500, and there are early adopters, and a um, number of these organizations, even if 200 adopted only two of these 20 recommendations, it's going to increase the, the awareness and welcoming in the community. And to lead by example, I do believe our board has the opportunity to do that. And I should correct myself with one word I will struggle with. Reconciliation, like the suffix re or the prefix re means happening again. Send and resend means I'm gonna send it again. I don't believe reconciliation happened in the history. So we're gonna be doing conciliation, not reconciliation to be genuine to it. That will stop and share. And I wonder if Nick would want to add more with your permission. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Nick, did you have anything to add to this? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, listening to the comments, and and I appreciate Dr. Ayer's comments. And uh, I know that it was brought up about uh, land acknowledgement um, at the health board. When we go into meetings uh, with municipalities or others, uh, whether they be proponents or not, uh, a land acknowledgement is given as a as recognition for the traditional lands of which we meet on. And that was one of the reasons why I brought that up. Uh, number two, I, I know that I opened it up to the health board members that wanted to come up to a sacred fire to be able to learn, to be able to sit with, uh, with other leaders from our communities so that they have an understanding of what it is that we are doing when we talk about those sacred fires and we talk about other things that uh, our community is going through and to build those relationships with our neighbors as we try to walk in parallel with an open heart and an open mind that is why i raised that i um respect everybody has their own beliefs and and I understand that everybody follows their own spirituality. But as a path of walking forward as leaders, um, that's, again, we I wanted to put that out there to an open invitation um, if we are doing something for people to be able to come and participate, build those relations, and and build on on new beginnings uh, with with our neighbors and, and our partners. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess what I'm wondering here is what are next steps forward on this? And if I read the recommendation that we have on those first two items, that the update be received by the Board of Health for information and use the recommendation going forward to audio report 12 sessions and collaborate with the Indigenous communities to develop and adopt land acknowledgement and participate in community events as steps on the reconciliation journey. There's kind of a lot in there, but it's not really saying what our next steps are going to be on that part of it with the Indigenous communities. Yes. Well, to break it down, I think we should move forward on the uh, land acknowledgement. So we'll uh, consult with both band councils and see. Um, what the current best practices on that? I think that would be um, appropriate to start right away. And then, as for the uh, community events, certainly as warden, I'm committed to uh, doing whatever um, community events at uh, Maywash and Saugeen that I can. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, the uh, breadth of the uh, 
information that we're dealing with in that recommendation. Like it's an enormous amount of stuff. And I'm wondering if it would be more appropriate to split it in two things because we have the recommendation regarding uh, affirming the uh, security policy and direction. And we have the recognition uh, of the need to develop a land acknowledgement. And as Gordon Peabody said, you know, there's there's the process we direct staff and uh, or the executive committee and our uh, indigenous community to work together. So I might be so bold as to uh, ask yourself or someone to split those two in in uh, split that one motion into two because it's it, it's just unwieldy in its uh, breadth. I believe. Thank you. That was somewhat my thought, which was why I was questioning. Um, it seems like a lot of two things that are really totally related built into one recommendation. And do we get confused going forward as to what we were actually intending? So if I could break that down, I would have one B that the update be received by the Board of Health for information and use a recommendation going forward to audio record closed sessions and stop there. Okay. And if I can have a mover and a seconder then on that, Chris and Helen Claire, any further discussion? Okay. okay, all in favor. That is carried. And then the sure. secondary to that, can make, we make a resolution as a recommendation to refer that back to the executive committee for further consideration and recommendation. In the, in the near future, when you know what of that policy, this is not just understood within the recommendation. It wasn't said, but I know you're right, it wasn't. I just wanted to be, I don't want to be lost in the translation. <laughs> so we, we've passed the one about affirming it. Yeah. So I would like to move that we refer uh, this policy to the executive committee. For further discussion to bring recommendation regarding um, additional policies and improvements. improvements. Okay. Yep. Would someone like to second that? Yep. Any further discussion or questions on that item? Okay, I will call the vote. All in favor. That is carried. And so then the next one will be to collaborate with the Indigenous communities to develop and adopt land acknowledgement and participate in community events as steps on the reconciliation journey. And I have a mover and a second there, Chris and Luke. And any further discussion? All in favor? That is here. Okay. The last item is 10.3, postponing the review of the results from the board's self-evaluation survey. Um, Dr. Ayer, are you speaking to this one? Yeah, Madam Chair, sure. uh, just uh, the, uh, the board in its last meeting um, reviewed the results uh, or received the results from the survey of the self-evaluation according to policy and directed the executive committee to uh, uh, examine that data and come up with recommendations for next steps uh, as for policy. The, uh, if, if you recall, in the executive committee decided to uh, postpone that step until we receive uh, other reports that could be collated all together to formulate next steps. So uh, we're bringing back that result uh, or, or the fact that the uh, evaluation is now can be completed until for, for later. And if the uh, board would receive that or the staff, that's basically the item. So that was discussed in executive committee. And I actually thought there had been a recommendation in that executive committee meeting that that's what we do is wait for the other reports to all be completed. So I'm not sure we need to deal with this here until we have all of those reports together. Just a minute, Helen Claire. The, the item uh, 
Madam Chair, that was discussed was a decision from the Executive Committee to postpone a recommendation for the board to postpone it for further. So the Executive Committee is directed by the board to do something, and the Executive Committee is recommending to the board to delay doing that thing. And that's why this is back here. Okay, okay. I, that makes sense. Helen Claire? Madam Chair, I'm 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 a uh, quite a bit confused by what's going on here. Um, in the 28th of June meeting, the executive committee was directed to take an action. Um, the executive committee is not an upper tier. To, it, it receives its authority from the board. So I don't really understand why the action that was directed has not been executed. I don't understand why this is now back in front of the board when the board already discussed and directed the executive committee to take an action. Um, and with regard to this being in, in front of us now, it has nothing to do with, with the items that are being used as a rationale to hold off on, on this. But to the point, this is a governance issue. This is a is somewhere where we are we're inclined to slip around this table, and I'm flagging this as one of those examples. Again, the executive committee is not an upper tier. The executive committee receives its authority from the board. The board gave a very clear direction in the June, I think, 28th uh, meeting, and that direction should be acted upon. If the executive committee is not capable for whatever reason of doing it, I strongly suggest that the board nominate an ad hoc committee to take care of this. It is, I think, extremely important because many of the things that were raised in that survey speak to issues that this board needs to improve upon. And so delaying that is not a good idea, in my opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I will look to others for any other comments. So seeing none, the recommendation we have here is that the Board of Health discusses and decides whether to postpone the review of the board self-evaluation survey reports. And I have a mover and a seconder in that loop. Sorry, Manager, you're asking for a mover of that rec that recommendation. Not really. It's not. A, well, it doesn't. I it doesn't. I just am not clear. It doesn't actually give any direction, does it? Or does it? Maybe I'm misunderstanding the recommendation. So, the, Madam Chair, if I may, the, it sounds as though the recommendation from the executive committee was to delay the assessment until you received further information to support and provide a fuller picture of the of the broad assessment. That's exactly it. That so, so only I, looking at board self-evaluation when we had two other things in the works as well, um, we felt we needed to pull that information together to be able to come back to the board with recommendations. So I would move that we receive and accept the report from the executive committee and uh, delay the uh, the self-assessment until we receive the more full summary. Thank you, Dr. Herrera. Second, Madam Chair, just to be clear. Oh, right. We need a second. Your first. Sorry. Thank you, Ken. Chris. Okay. Go ahead. Madam Chair, as as I share my opinion, my recommendation to proceed with it because it is an entity on its own. The other report is the MOH evaluation. Regardless of what the outcome of the MOH evaluation is. Uh, the board evaluation is complete from data point of view. And the most importantly, the other item we're waiting for is actually an item that's going to assess whether our board did the 2023, 2023 uh, self evaluation or not. So we might be in a position where we're putting ourselves in the foot, getting less points on that evaluation if we hold on this one. Again, to be complete, that's my recommendation, and it's very consistent with our policy. So Again, I to be to be complete there. Thank you. Uh, look, did I see your hand up? No, Madam Chair. Uh, no, I'm prepared to vote on the resolution. 
Okay, so if there are no other comments or questions there, I will call the vote on that recommendation. All in favor? Any opposed? It is, mm -hmm. it is still carried. It's four to three. Next item is moving in camera. So I need a motion mover and seconder to move in camera for 11.1 .1 adoption of in camera minutes from Friday, June 28th and Monday, July 8th. 11.2 third party information supply and confidence to the municipality, which should disclose could significantly prejudice a competitive position or interfere with negotiations. And 11.3 advice subject to solicitor client privilege, section 239.2F. But I have a mover and a seconder, please. Chris and Sue, all in favor? That is carried. We are now in session. So I'll just wait to be sure, staff, that we need to go ahead for that. So we went in camera only to discuss the items that were listed when we went in camera. And I will now call for a mover and a seconder to adjourn. Chris and Sue, all in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.